Good day, my friends. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. You can always visit us online at mymdi.org and download previous episodes of the Daily Torah Podcast. Contact us and let us know what you are learning so far. We always love to hear from our listeners. Today we are on day six of this week's exciting Daily Torah series, Kaye Sarah, The Life of Sarah. Yesterday we examined the two choices laid before Rebecca, and if she is the chosen one to fulfill the assigned mission given by Abraham to find a wife for his son Isaac. Today we will know the answer. Will she stay or will she go? What choice will Rebecca make? Let's find out. If you have your Bibles and notepads handy, get them ready or listen and review later. Let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 24, beginning in verse 50. In Genesis 24, verse 50, we read, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you, either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass, when Abraham's servant heard their words, that he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, saying, Then the servant uh, brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning and he said, send me away to my master. And then in verse 55, but her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. After that she may go. And he, Eliezer, said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. Now, my friends, why did Rebekah's brother and mother suddenly have this change of heart overnight? Now, notice, my friend, Laban, Rebekah's brother, really is the one who seems to be running the negotiations here. Why the delay in staying? Well, in the Targum of Jonathan, Avranali uh, and others suggest that Laban and Bethuel hoped to receive more gifts from Isaac's family by delaying Rebekah's departure, perhaps thinking that these would be offered in exchange for letting Rebekah leave immediately. We can better understand Laban's proposal that Rebecca be consulted. For whatever reason, he felt that he stood to benefit from Rebecca tarrying in Haran and assumed that his sister would understand that she was expected to bow to her family's wishes regardless of her own desires. Laban's tone communicated to her that he was speaking rhetorically rhetorically as if to say, would you actually leave in defiance of your family's wishes? By seemingly allowing Rebecca to make the final decision, Laban hoped to get his way without being seen as failing to honor his word. And as we will see in our future Torah portions, my friends, Laban's behavior here foreshadows his deceitful dealings with Jacob. Now, continuing the story in Genesis 24, in verse 57, So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and their nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. My friends, Laban's plan fails here, and in striking fashion, because Rebekah replies, Alech, 
I will go. Why is she so intent upon leaving? Well, a midrash suggests that she seeks to escape a world of intrigue and duplicity. Rebecca is a lily among the thorns, a daughter and a sister of deceivers, who nonetheless is and wishes to remain righteous. She can accomplish this only by finding a new home for herself. Do you see, my friends, how much of a virtuous woman Rebecca is and why God chose her to be the mother of Israel, of Jacob? Her life of integrity, purity, and righteousness is an example for us all. Now let's turn to our half Torah portion, continuing the story of David and Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 23 to 26, in 1 Kings chapter 1, starting in verse 23, we read, So they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and has sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's sons and the commanders of the army and Abiathar the priest. And look, they are eating and drinking before him and they say, Long live King Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Benajab the son of J. Ho Ida, nor your servant Solomon. Now, yesterday I misspoke and I said Adonijah was the firstborn, but he was actually the fourth of David's sons. The firstborn, my friends, was Amnon, then Daniel, also known as Kilib, then Absalom, then Adonijah. All of these had different mothers. Amnon, David's firstborn, was born in Hebron to Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Ab Ab Absalom killed him after he raped Absalom's full sister, Tamar. The Bible doesn't record what happened to his second-born Daniel, also known as Kilib. He is only named in the list of David's sons, and no further mention is made of him. Many believe he may have died while he was young. But according to Rashi, Rabbi Isaac said that some question whether Abigail was pregnant through David or her first husband, Nabal. Therefore, God arranged that Kilib would resemble David, and it is possible his name, Kilib, which can be translated perfection of the father, is a reference or a cause of that legend. Nevertheless, after the death of his elder brothers, Abnan and Absalom, Adonijah, considered himself the heir apparent to the throne. And as I mentioned yesterday, God's ways are not always the ways of men. And like David, who was chosen in place of his elder brothers, so was Solomon. God looks on the heart and not the stature, good looks, or popularity of a man. We will see how this story concludes in tomorrow's episode. But let's turn to our Brit Hadashah portion, transitioning to a passage in Luke 9, uh, in verses 57 through 62. If we go to Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57, we read, As they went on their way, a certain man said to him, Yeshua, I want to follow you wherever you go, Lord. And Yeshua said to them, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. But Yeshua said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but you go and announce the kingdom of God. And another also said, I want to follow you, Lord, but first allow me to bid farewell to those who are at my house. But Yeshua said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. 
My friends like Laban and Bethuel who wanted to keep Rebecca from following God's purpose in her life, these who encountered Yeshua proclaiming they wanted to follow Yeshua wherever he went, but in reality their hearts were not in the work of the Messiah and what he was doing. What about you, my friend? Are you making excuses to not follow Yeshua, your Messiah, fully with all your heart and soul? Are you looking back like Lot's wife to the riches and fun you think you will be missing out on in this world if you give up your life and become a bondservant to the creator of the universe? How absurd a thought is that when you think about it? On one hand, you're thinking, I can live in pleasure for my short existence as a human, or I can choose to follow the giver of eternal life. But there is a cost, my friend. Because if we are only following Yeshua to get something, then as Yeshua says, we are not fit for the kingdom of God. In Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, we read, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Let us be like the scribe who interacted with Yeshua in Mark 12, verses 32 to 34. In Mark 12, the scribe said to Yeshua, after this encounter with him, he says, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbors as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Yeshua saw that he answered wisely, he said to him in verse 34, You are not far from the kingdom of God. My friends, let us purpose it in our whole being to love God with all our heart, with all understanding, with all our soul and strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Then, and only then, will we be fit and ready to enter the kingdom of God. So my friends, let's end it here today. Meditate on these words today. Pray for us in this message to go out. Get involved in this work. Pray for those who are scattered throughout the world seeking their Messiah, that they will return to Torah in their Hebraic roots. Share this message with your friends and family. Post a link on your social media pages and help us spread the gospel. You never know whose life you may affect. Remember to visit us at mymdi.org. Take one of our free classes. Download the daily Torah schedule. You can also order the Daily Torah series of books to follow along with. And if the Lord inspires you, please consider becoming a monthly sponsor so we can reach more people with these messages. Just click the Giving Menu option or the Day Donate button on the website. So until tomorrow, my friends, Shalom Aleichem, blessings and Shalom.